So the light bulb came on. I talked to my wife and I said, I want to take a chance. And there's over $700 million in research budgets, which is more than all the other New Jersey universities combined. The sharks, you know, once you enter the shark tank, they, uh, it's a mess in there. You know, it's not how they present it on, on TV. And that's what gave me the aha moment when I realized that I want to write people's memoirs. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. Well, you just heard a little teaser from the people that are going to be on the show. So stay tuned and hear the rest of the story. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about entrepreneurs, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. And tonight on our show, we have Chris Myers, who's the president and CEO of Environmental Laboratories. And in addition to that, we also have Bavita Howe from Rutgers University. And Dr. Juan with a snack that your kids are actually going to like that's healthy for them. You got to hear all about this. And then Richard Squires. Uh, do you want to leave your kids a legacy that's not just money, that's something that can be passed down through your family for years? Well, Richard Squires with Life Story has the answer for you. I have lots of legacies that I want to pass <laughs> Lots of stories you wouldn't want in the <laughs> and, and book. And plenty of stories that they should never hear. I get, I'm totally there. But before we get to that, let's do IP in the news. So okay. uh, who's going first today? I'll go first with my silly little thing. So Okay. I was online looking at funny trademarks and I at bestlifeonline.com, I found this article by Sarah Crow. So did you know that you can even trademark the sound of someone's breathing? I did know that, but I didn't know that anybody would do that. Well, Lucas Films did. They trademarked Darth Vader's infamous breathing through his helmet and it was created by breathing through a scuba regulator. <laughs> So well, that, that's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, I mean, how can anybody trademark breathing? You know, well, and I guess it is distinctive, right? So that's well, one of the requirements of trademark uh, ability. And uh, but I'm surprised it's not generic because that sound has been used a lot in a lot of different places, especially so. this last year. <laughs> could, everybody on a ventilator. Could, since they can trademark smells, could they trademark his breath too? God, that's so <laughs> <not>. <laughs> no. Well. That sounds like, um, that sounds really interesting. And I guess the moral of the story there is that you can trademark uh, sounds and you can trademark smells if they are uh, distinctive. So a lot of the jingles that you hear on TV, for example, Law and Order, dum, 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 that intro is trademarked. But they only trademark it in certain classifications, right? So they probably only trademarked it for like use in movies and stuff, right? Well, right, you can't like trademark it for all categories like human beings and stop them from breathing. Right. So, <laughs> so. so anyway, yeah, it's it's that's true. Trademarks are limited to certain classes of goods. And um, so they could only trademark uh, M4 films and probably toys is probably where they went with that one. So, so now on to the ex-royals. Yeah, the ex-royals, uh, my favorite subject, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Of course, everybody has an opinion on them. And uh, so they're actually in a trademark dispute. I think they're getting off to a little bit of a rocky start when it comes to their branding. Uh, their first trademark guy, a better trademark by attorney. the queen. They need a trademark attorney who, who helps with well, when, branding. When the queen of England rejects your mark, you, you're, you're in big trouble. So, so what was that mark again? I forget, what, was they, what were they gonna do? I think they it were was- They were gonna do Sussex something. Sussex Royal. Sussex Royal, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, I guess it wasn't just the Queen who complained, a lot of other people did too. And um, so they came up with another name and that was Arkwell. Archwell. Arkwell? Arkwell? I don't know if it's Arkwell or Archwell. It has an E in the middle of it, so. And so they announced that they were going to brand their products with this name. And then all of these, you know, pirates jumped in and started filing trademark applications before they got a chance to file trademark applications. Right. So somebody in the Philippines in July 2020 filed for jewelry and the, the, the people in the Philippines that are fighting the royals said. <laughs> You're going to love this because go Ar ahead. Arquil is now a registered trademark in the Philippines. And it's not a former British colony. English laws don't work here. 
So <laughs> I point my nose in the general direction of the royals, ex-royals, and so there. So, so the moral of the story is... Well, I guess the moral of the story is don't go public with your brand before you have your trademark strategy done. And trademarks are all based on use. So whoever uses the mark first is the one who gets it. And that use actually has to be in commerce. You have to sell something uh, using the mark. And in the case of the Philippines, uh, they do have registrations there for Arcwell. Um, one of them is for deodorant. So I guess that cuts <laughs> Harry and Megan out of the deodorant market. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, if they yeah. were using Arcwell for deodorant before, you know, um, before the Royals decided to announce their brand, then it, they're first. And so, um, so it's all based on use and whoever did it first is the one that gets the rights. Right, but it can be in dis different categories and classifications. So, right. right, so you can get it for cookies and somebody else can get it for tires or something, right? Right, but yeah. on the other mm -hmm. hand, you know, how big is the Philippine market? And, you know, if, if, you, if they can't sell deodorant in the Philippines, is that really going to put a dent in their income? I mean, and they're, they're just going to town on all this and they got really mad. So anyways, I, yeah, knows? trademarks are a lot more complicated than you think, <laughs> but I personally yes. am extremely excited about the show that we have today. And we get to ask everybody on the show now what they think about IP. Okay. So, so this is Richard's round table. So, uh, you know, based on what you just heard, uh, do you have any thoughts or comments, Chris? Sure. So uh, we've been involved uh, in depth in regards to trademarking uh, with a number of our brands and IP, uh, things like uh, Don't Guess Test, we own that registered trademark. Um, our Science, Your Peace of Mind, we own that registered trademark. Safe Home and Biotest Kiss, the list goes on and on. And we use uh, a firm in Indianapolis, Barnes and Thornburg, and this is not a plug for them. They're just really good at what they do. Uh, and they advise us, so you, you wanna talk to an attorney uh, who's going to give you the right guidance. Do you want to register in the United States only, or do you want to have a, a trademark that's going to go outside of the U.S.? If so, what countries are you considering? And there's a whole consideration. Now, I'm going to come back to you with a question because I've not asked this question to my team yet, and I want, it, I want an answer from you two. Why do some people, why do some brands use the TM and stay with the TM? They never go to the R. Why is that? Well, um, do you mind if I answer the question? Please. I would love to answer this question. And the answer is pretty simple. I mean, TM is sort of an informal notification that you consider the mark proprietary. And so in addition to federal registrations, there's something known as common law trademark rights. And you get rights for any mark that you use, any mark that qualifies as a trademark, um, in the geographical areas that you use it. And so some people want to put others on notice that they, uh, that they do consider it a, a trademark under common law rights. And they use the TM symbol to warn people and it serves as a deterrent. Um, and so if you don't want to go through the trouble of registering a, a federal trademark or you can't or, um, you don't want to invest in that particular word, using a TM is, 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 is acts as a warning. And okay. honestly, most people don't know the difference between a TM and an R. So sure. it, it does have a deterrent. I know the R costs a lot more money. Right, right. exactly. And, uh, but but you, you, you need, get much stronger rights. I was going to say, you sure. need the R if you have to go to court, right? Right. Well, you can go to court on the... Uh, can you go to court on just the oh, TM? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, but you, you, you get... On, why would you do the R then? Well, because there's certain types of damages that you can get with R, and you, if you're, if you're, um, if you have common law rights, then you have to prove the common law rights. And so, if you have a registration, it's much easier to prove your use of the mark. So that's certainly not my bailiwick, but it's super interesting. I like sitting back and listen, listening to these kinds of. I'm, a, I'm an information geek, so I like learning about these things. Well, um, we appreciate that. <laughs> Listen, anyone who likes IP is near and dear to my heart. So, <laughs> well, he is a chemist after all. I mean, let's face it. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so uh, that was excellent. Thank you. So, so now Pavita gets a turn, right? Yeah, Pavita. 
tell us a little bit about what you think. My question is, uh, with, with uh, copyrights and trademarks, uh, I had the experience of creating a name and then having someone come and say, uh, sorry, you can't use that name. So when is it worthwhile to fight for that name? Um, and when is it better to walk away and start over? Because uh, the advice I was given was, in this case, it's probably not worthwhile to fight that fight. Well, that's a great question too. And it's really an economic decision. Um, how much is it gonna cost you to rebrand and how much goodwill with your customers are you gonna lose versus the cost of enforcing the mark and the likelihood of success? So, right, and if it's just an emotional decision, like I just really love this word. Well, sometimes you have to have your heart broken. <laughs> And so uh, most of the time I, what you've encountered, right, is it's better just to, to really do the, a good trademark search before you brand even. Right. And then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, choosing a name, um, you should do a search, uh, not only an online search, you should at least check the uh, trademark office. And really, if you're serious about the business, you should have an uh, intellectual property professional uh, do that because there's more to it than just looking for the same name. Um, but at least as a minimum, you should do those two things. And then uh, you, the mark publishes uh, after it goes through the registration process, third parties can contest the mark if they think it makes sense to do that. Um, but we've had people who've had their marks for seven, eight, nine years. Uh, they didn't really do a good job of searching it and out of nowhere somebody comes and accuses them of trademark infringement and they've got a huge investment in goodwill and, uh, and they run up a lot of big legal bills because they don't wanna change their name, uh, but all the customers know them by that name and they don't wanna rebrand, but the other company doesn't want them to use the name that's so close. So it's involving a trademark professional early on can save you a lot of money down the road. It's worth the, few thousand dollars you might pay. That so. was a great point, Pavita. Great question. Yeah, thank you. And good advice too. <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Juan. Hi, uh, yeah, I got um, a comment on trademarks. Um, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this situation. Um, so we have a trademark, for instance, in our, our brand, Peanut Crunch, and also in our mascot. Um, but recently I noticed that someone in Canada is using a similar very looking like, um, you know, figurine, just like we don't use as a mascot for a product that is similar to ours. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a peanut containing product as well. Um, so, you know, I, I come, we are a small company, um, so we don't have a lot of money to invest into lawyers or anything like that. Uh, what would be your recommendation in terms of uh, addressing this, you know, could potentially, they could potentially be copying me. Uh, is it even worth spending the money on, you know? Right. Uh, Do you mind if I answer this question? No, please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, uh, that's a, that's an interesting uh, question. And it's a challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs uh, when they run across a situation like that. Um, one of the first things you want to do is find out if they're using it in the United States and you wanna to try to find out when they started using it in the United States, because again, it's priority of use. So you may think that you have a first use um, but, and they're copying you, but it may turn out that they came up with the, you know, the same approach that you did beforehand. And so before you rattle their chain, you want to make sure that you know you have priority. And I have seen this come back in uh, clients' faces where they accuse somebody of trademark infringement, and then they find out that they, the other party's been using the mark for 20 years, and they've been using it for two, and now the you know, party they're accusing is demanding that they stop using it. Right. Um, right. And so if they're using it in Canada, it doesn't count in, in the United States. And so yeah, my recommendation would be to do, in, in Canada, I, I believe is first to register state uh, country. So you need to think about, uh, I mean, I would, I would contact a, a, a trademark professional and, and get some more specific advice based on the facts that you could do and mm -hmm. just tell them that you're on a limited budget. And usually 
they can help you figure out a solution to at least you know move forward and um and uh the but the major issue is are you do you plan to sell in canada eventually um and who who got there first if they did then you may work out some sort of concurrent use agreement sometimes that's possible where parties agree just to not go after each other there's a lot of options so yeah. i will say juan brought up a really good point though just because you have a trademark in the U.S. doesn't mean you have it everywhere. So you have to trademark your product in every single country in which you wish to do business. All right. Okay. Thank you. So. And you can file that trademark. Um, again, I don't want to go into the weeds here, but uh, you right. should talk contact. to Richard after the show. Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. Okay, Richard, you've been waiting so patiently. <laughs> well, it's been a very interesting learning, uh, listening to this. I, I love to learn new things. Um, yeah, the uh, just thinking about Darth Vader's breathing, it's so recognizable. It's, it's amazing, you know, if someone was to just play a, a sound clip for me of, a, of hearing someone breathing through scuba gear, it's very likely I'd say, oh, that sounds like Darth Vader. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which probably helps uh, George Lucas's case. Um, thinking about Prince Harry and that situation, um, you know, it's interesting to learn that, you know, again, just what you said about having to register in each country. And I, I just ha happen to have a client who I'm working with right now. I'm writing her memoir and she's from the Philippines. She's from a city called Ozamis. And she was telling me how densely populated it is and that actually Philippines is one of the more populated countries. So. That's oh, well, so maybe it is a market worth fighting over. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess, you know, that thanks for bringing that perspective. OK, so Kenya. Kenya. Kenya gets yeah. It. So it was interesting to also hear about the, the Darth Vader breathing thing. And I, it made me curious to know if there's ever been any media personalities, particularly in radio, because, you know, there's a lot of distinctive voices who have ever just like decided to get their voice patented or protected or what you would, you know, however you would do that, Richard. I don't know. Um, I'm sure there have been trademarks uh, from, you know, like I said, you know, show openings and closings can be trademarked. And so there's quite a few of those. Um, whether, you know, radio personalities have uh, sort of specific statements trademarked, um, my guess is there probably are, none come to mind right off the top of my head. Uh, I once thought it would be fun to try to get a design patent on William Shatner's smile. And I was gonna approach him and say, look it, I'll get a design patent on your smile. And he'd be the first, he'd be the first celebrity with a, his, his face patented. And uh, he, I just, gone uh, and, and, and he probably would have gone for it. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of celebrities who have their names trademarked. And um, so that's very common. Uh -huh. um, but, really great idea, Kenya. I think that opened a whole new market up for Richard. Well, I was going to say all the iHeart radio personalities should go to Gearheart Law yeah. and, and find out. Well, we, we, we've worked with uh, DJ Envy on a, uh, on a project. And um, so he was, he was he's, he's a pretty cool guy. And um, there's, there's lots of things to, um, you know, lots of things to protect. So right. anyway, so, I think it's time that we get on to our guest. Thank you, Kenya. That was marvelous. Um, so um, Chris, uh, welcome again to the show and tell us about what your company does. Before we go there, let me tell you about Paul Harvey really quick. I heard he was one of the first voice personalities to trademark his voice. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Oh. You can Google that and look into it, but I, he either tried it or he got it done. But Paul Harvey, I mean, it's a really interesting story, but after this is over, if you're interested in that kind of trivia, you can Google that. There we you go. Will. Maybe we'll uh, answer the question at our next show. So in, stay tuned a week from now to hear, did Paul Harvey trademark his voice? Maybe you should get Paul, is, is Paul Harvey still alive? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. <laughs> he, he has a cool, and he has a cool voice it. and it's very distinctive though, that's for sure. That, that yeah. is for sure. And that's yes. the rest of the story. And that's the rest of the story. That <laughs> yeah. sounds like it's right. Be. Very good. You did well. <laughs> I'm telling my age. <laughs> anyway, um, Chris, I am so excited. Okay, so for people that don't know me, I have a doctorate in analytical environmental chemistry. And Chris started an environmental company years ago, like before people like right. 
yeah, right at the dawn, right? So tell us how that happened and how that went and how you have done, like, what did you say, your 7 million sample or? Uh, 6 million. 6 million sample, Six million sample. testing? Yeah, right, wow. in our laboratory, yeah. So I started out, um, I actually thought I was going to play Major League Baseball I, out of high school. I grew up on a small farm, um, had a lot of, I was athletic. I was fortunately good in the books too but I was, I was a male young guy and I wanted to go play professional baseball. So I went to college, had a good round with it, had a tryout with the White Sox and I didn't make it. <laughs> so I had to go back to school and that's where I met my wife. So the good Lord had a different plan for me. And I went back to Indiana University, uh, double major in biology and chemistry. And then I thought, okay, I'm not gonna play uh, professional baseball, so I'm going to coach. So I thought I'll coach this, I'll coach that. <laughs> they should really let you do your student teaching first. So when I did my student teaching, I thought, I can't do this. I do not have the patience for this. I don't have that <laughs> bandwidth to be able to do this correctly. So a guy that I was in a biochemistry class with said, man, we need an environmental scientist at our power plant. I was with AEP, American Electric Power. And he said, you have background in the environmental sciences. I've heard you talk. He said, we could really use you. So I called him and I said, Frank, is that job still open? He said, yes, and I took the job. So I actually started out working for AEP. Uh, my wife, uh, elementary school teacher, three children, uh, you know, uh, a house mortgage and just the list goes on and on. So I started consulting on the side, moonlighting. And I found I really enjoyed going and helping people, going to industries, uh, uh, municipalities and helping them understand about how uh, to test their water and how to fill out permits for, for the state of Indiana or for the US EPA. And so it got to where I was actually making more money moonlighting than I was working for AEP. So the light bulb came on. I talked to my wife and I said, I want to take a chance. And I will sit here and tell you right now, for you to be an entrepreneur, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, you have to be willing to roll the dice. Uh, if you are adver adverse to risk, do not become an entrepreneur. You will not sleep, you will not eat, you will be, uh, feel like you're in trouble all the time. Doesn't mean you have to be, uh, doesn't mean- Not to be, be discouraging. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't mean you have to be a bad gambler, it just means you have to be smart. I'll never forget, I heard this said once. Somebody said, uh, I don't uh, just throw the spit water against the wall to see if it's stick. I take an educated guess I do my research to think, is there a good chance that spit was going to stick on the wall? And that sounds gross, but that was the analogy. Uh, but so we uh, decided to take a second mortgage in our home and um, found out that there was a laboratory in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, I actually knew the, the gentleman who owned it, went down and made him an offer. And I got some of the guys that I played uh, on a traveling softball team with, uh, I hired them with pizza and beer. And we took a U-Haul truck and drove to Evansville and brought the laboratory back to Madison and literally uh, incorporated the company in 1982. I continued to work to at AEP until I built up a strong client base, then left there, and I never looked back. And now we have nearly 40 employees, and we're one of the largest environmental testing laboratories uh, in the Midwest. Great. That's amazing. I mean, you make it sound like you just kind of fell into it, but that you did it at exactly the right time because... I was in school in Colorado during those years in, um, well, I think I hadn't quite got to Colorado yet, but anyway, that is when these testing labs started to pop up and the people that got in at that time on the ground floor really were the flagship brands for that. And that's how, I mean, that's just amazing that you had the foresight to, to do that too. Well, and I love it. I, I can't tell you enough of that. I mean, I absolutely love what I do. I, I, I never feel like I go to work one day. That's great. So Chris, can I, can, I, can I ask you a question? And that is, what kinds of things does an environmental laboratory test and who do they test them for? Great question. So starting out, we were doing regulated testing only. Regulated testing means that you're performing the testing for an entity that is required to have the testing done, like uh, the federal government, US EPA, uh, your state government, uh, county government, city government, some agency 
that has control over your discharge of waste, solid waste or liquid waste, or the drinking water that you're dispersing to the end users, uh -huh. uh, th that's regulated testing. So we started out with regulated testing only. So that, that means if a company is has waste or is contaminating someplace, they have to submit a report to the government to make correct. sure that they're compliant with government regulations. Or the drinking water too. Like yeah, it's correct. On, you're both correct. Wastewater side, solid waste, yes. They have to send a report in on the drinking water side. They also have to send reports in to make sure that they're providing good water to the end users. Of course, then you could get into talking about Flint, Michigan, right. Wichita Falls, Texas, San Diego, California, Newark, New Jersey, where utilities had one or more employees that did not do their job well, or they the infrastructure just imploded. And again, that's a whole nother conversation that I travel all the United States talking about on the drinking water side. But drinking water is primarily what we do. 70% uh, of our revenue is drinking water. And so as time passed over the years since 1982, it became very competitive, the industry for regulated testing. So you'll find this uh, <laughs> kind of a neat little story, but we started taking little 150 milliliter bottles and we were taking them around to county health departments and soil and water conservation districts in Indiana. And we had a little system. And so we put these little colored dots on top of the bottles, blue, red, green, purple, yellow. And uh, I think we even had a white dot, but anyway, so we called it the rainbow bottle program because of the different colors of the dots on top. You were of ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we took these into these locations so that the general public could come in and take these bottles with the paperwork for free. They could just go and get them, take them home, call our desk Monday through Friday, give a credit card. We'd take their payment. They'd fill the bottle, fill out the paperwork, take it back to the County Health Department or Soil and Water Conservation District. And we have route drivers that pick up samples on the regulated side, well, we just had our route drivers stop by those health departments and the solar water conservation districts and pick up those samples. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how Safe Home branded drinking water test kits for use by the general public came to fruition. We oh, actually wow. established, we established a division called Enviro Test Kits, which mm -hmm. we registered that trademark. Um, then we had a brand and started these, building these little test kits. If you saw the, the rainbow bottle program versus where we are today, uh, <laughs> you can go to safehometestkits.com. You can go to Amazon. Our brand is everywhere. Menards, uh, Home Depot. You can see safe home water quality test kits. If you look at those kits and then think about a little 150 milliliter bottle with dots on top of it, that was the evolution. Wow. wow. Yeah. So we, we've gone from the county health departments into retail and uh, now Amazon is amazing for us. We sell, I can't tell you, but a lot. We sell a lot of kits on Amazon. Well, a lot so, of people are concerned about their water. Right, so do people still need to send the kits in or can do can they analyze, yeah. get a, a result right there? Sure, sure. And we have two platforms of testing. Great question. Uh, two platforms of testing, do it yourself. We call it you test it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we have these do it yourself test kits that the consumer can buy. Uh, it'll ship to their home and they can test it at home and get the results there. And some of the tests are a matter of seconds. Other kits are a matter of minutes, but you can get the results at home. Do-it-yourself testing is awesome for uh, screening your drinking water to get approximate values mm -hmm. of the uh, values of the parameters that you're testing. But if you really want to know the exact values, we have other kits that are called we test it or in-lab mm -hmm. test kits. And they can buy those online. Uh, they buy them out of the stores. They fill the vials and we have free return shipping to our laboratory. They just drop it in their mailbox. The vials come back to our lab. We extract the vials and we can test. We have a kit. You're not going to believe this. We have so a kit. So Chris, I got a yeah, quick go question for you. Yeah, go ahead. What, um, how does bottled water stand up when you do these tests? Because we've all been convinced that bottled water is healthier than tap water. And I'm just curious, is it, is, is it better or is it healthier? You cannot say that in broad spectrum. Uh, some of the bottled water companies do the right due diligence. They perform testing on their water. Uh, bottled water is not regulated by the US EPA like tap water is the sent to our homes. It's regulated by another entity. Mm. And, and to say it's more loosely regulated is true. Now somebody will take offense to that, but it's tr absolutely true. 
Um, but it, we have a lot of people who send bottled water samples into our laboratory uh, and we perform the analysis on it so they can know. So and, I can ask a question? Yeah. So I'm just, <laughs> as chemist, of course, Gary. <laughs> so you're obviously testing for metals, I assume. Are you? And I know that like some of the filters say they filter bacteria, but can you test for the plastics that might leach out of the plastic bottles or what is the range that you can test? Yes, for? so we have the ultimate test kit. It tests for 200 parameters. You can again, go onto Amazon, wow. uh, Home Depot, our website. The ultimate test kit tests for 200 different parameters. That's bacteria, physical properties, inorganic contaminants, over 30 different metals and over 150 different organic uh, parameters that are carcinogens. So the answer is yes. Wow, so are those based on the EPA list? Yes, they are. Oh. As a matter of fact, there's, there's thousands more, but you just can't test for everything. Right. But the ultimate test kit, it was named uh, the best overall water test kit in the US last year by the Spruce and again this year by the Spruce and Good Housekeeping named it the best overall water test kit. Now it sells for $400, it's pricey, but if you took those same 200 parameters to a laboratory, you'd pay closer to a thousand. Wow, so in terms of as a consumer, am I better off buying bottled water or drinking tap water? Well, again, day in and day out, uh, I prefer bottled water uh, just because I don't know a lot of the tap water. I test my own tap water at home so I know it's there, but I put a reverse osmosis system in my home I don't take any chances because there can be what they call burps or upsets. So any utility can be doing their job 364 days a year. But that one day a year, if they have a burp, they have a hiccup, and you're not ready for it at your home, you don't know what you're drinking. And it could be heavy metals. It could be microbiological bacteria, coliform bacteria. Uh, this, the list goes on and on. And again, we won't get into that. But fair question. If, you, if I went into a stranger's home, they said, Chris, would you like tap water or bottled water? Uh, 10 times out of 10, I would ask for the bottled water. But I, I probably would first ask if they had reverse osmosis water. Right. Well, because there's a lot of lead in the old pipes. And that was one thing that had, that's what happened in Flint was the lead got leached right. out because they changed the source of the water. And anyways. Um, what but, about what about Brita water filters? So, yeah, we filter yeah. through our fridge and yeah. that's what the water we drink. So out. refrigerator filters, filter water, uh, water filter pitchers, uh, dispensers and so on. Again, there's the, um, what I want to say, the low end, the mid range and the high end. Right. Do your research because they're not all created equal. Fascinating. Right. Yeah. So Kenya, do you have a comment or question? I do. I just was curious. What is the scariest testing scenario you've ever seen? Oh, the most serious? Oh, gosh. You and I could talk. I love the name Coach Kenya, by the way. I'm going to hear what you coach. We'll look, I want to learn about that later. But being a, you know, an ex-athlete, I love to talk about sports, too. Uh, but anyway, um, so I guess one of the most serious, it's a series, but uh, there was a farm, actually a huge ranch that was a... Um, they had uh, mares and studs that they re reproduced. It was a breeding farm. And the home, I mean, this was probably a $5 million ranch at least. I mean, they had the finances to do whatever they wanted. The home was on a city water supply, but the, the barn and the fields, they had all the watering trough was on well water supplies. And for those who don't know, a well water supply is when you drill down through the earth's crust and through the hard pan and you access an aquifer which is an underground river, literally, it's an underground river. And the pressure comes up through your, the well piping and comes out the top. So that's well water. A lot of people say, well water is better than city water. And people say city water is better than well water. And again, they're not all created equal and one's not necessarily better than the other. But so we, we received a phone call and we told them to send us a water sample. But the reason they did so was because their mares and their studs were dying. Mm. The foals were being stillborn or being born deformed. They knew something was wrong. They brought in a lot of specialists and they said, test the water. So we sent them a test kit and come to find out. And again, I can't tell you names for proprietary reasons, uh, but an industry over 50 miles away, matter of fact, I think it's closer to 60 miles away, that was upstream on the aquifer had been discharging waste onto their property, which was hundreds of acres, just throwing it out on their property for decades. And it finally got into this aquifer. 
And it was like, it didn't start when they first had the ranch, but um, we were part of that lawsuit from the analytical standpoint as professional witnesses. But there's just things like that. And there's an, another one, goat's milk. Who thinks goat's milk could ever be bad for you, right? Uh, a landfill that's close to these people's home uh, had paint cans that had cyanide cleaner in it. And over the decades, the paint cans had you know, finally been crushed by tons of dirt on the landfill and water seeping down through and oxidizing the paint cans and it burst open and that cyanide got down into that aquifer and that water table. Well, the home was on again, city water supply, but the feed that they mixed for the goats, the water they gave to the goats and the water they put on their pasture was all this water from the well water. And uh, the cyanide was over a hundred times the US EPA uh, maximum contamination level. Uh, and the matter of fact, those people died not long after that. They actually, the, the kind of funny side to this is she came to our laboratory with her lawyer first. She thought her husband was trying to poison her. Truth. <laughs> wow. Three okay. weeks later, three weeks later, the husband shows up with his attorney saying she's trying to poison him. <laughs> and so because of confidentiality, we can't tell either one what we're doing. But finally, one of the attorneys calls us and tells us, hey, we just come to the realization these, aren't, these two aren't trying to poison each other. So we got to the root of the system and we found out what was wrong. We had to backtrace the aquifer and finally we found out where the cyanide was coming from. But they're just exotic birds. We had another one where they had uh, exotic birds that this family was raising in a pinned in area with a farm pond. Well, because of the property around that area, they had runoff of pesticides and, and uh, insecticides into the pond. And they had birds that were like two, three, four thousand dollars a piece. And they were breeding these birds, wanting to reproduce to sell the birds. But the eggshells, because of the pesticides, made the eggshells so thin that when the mother sat on them to try to hatch them, they'd crush the eggs before the babies could be born. Uh, and just, I mean, I could go on and on. I have hundreds of these stories, but well, I do want, those are so, some of them, Coach, to, to tell you. Coach, <laughs> so, about. Chris, I, I do want to talk about one thing, Chris, while okay. we're on this type sure. of subject, and sure. that is arsenic in rice. So arsenic right. uptake or rice uptakes arsenic over other plants because of the way it's grown in water and the arsenic is in the water, right? So sure. um, can you- There are other plants that absorb it well, quite well as well, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so- when you so then they take that rice and they make baby food so right. can you test your baby food for arsenic using your kits and do you i mean i feel like there's there could be i'm i haven't studied this or researched it a correlation between arsenic in baby food and all the autism and other diseases that we're seeing now that weren't so prevalent years ago because it was in the 80s they really used all these pesticides on all of the crops, right? And sure. so can you test for that with your test? No, not with, our, not with these kits. Now we do test food products at our laboratory, Okay. Uh, but we don't test those with these test kits. Now we have about 20 different test kits on the market right now. Most of them are in-lab test kits where you send the samples back into our laboratory for analysis. And you can go online and download your lab report 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's really easy. A lot of people take the lab report to the uh, water treatment professionals who can recommend a reverse osmosis system for their home with our lab report. But to circle back to your question, uh, we do test food products, other solids. I mean, we had we had somebody who had a um, what was treated lumber. They had a deck. They built a deck out of treated lumber. They had a cat and a dog die. They took the third dog to the vet and come to find out that the dog's blood was super high in chrome and arsenic. Mm. Uh, treated lumber is pressure treated with uh, chromium, um, let's see, copper and arsenic. Well, what happens is rain that falls is acidic. That acid rain hits the platform of the panels of the deck. And then when the sun comes out, that UV radiation hits that water on that deck and has causes a, a, a reaction to take place then that water continues to get washed off below the deck. These cats and dogs were going underneath the deck and drinking out of the mud puddles. They were unaware, the homeowners were unaware. And then that ended up being something that they, they come to find out and realize that um, it, was, it was a bad scenario. But anyway, wow. 
We, we can test food products though, or any solid, but mostly drinking water or water related items, lakes, streams, ponds, we, we test it all. Excellent. Well, and you've built a huge business out of it, but you obviously have something people really want and need. So. And how can people find you uh, and your test kits? Yeah, so uh, Safe Home uh, Drinking Water Test Kits. You can go to Amazon, uh, homedepot.com, Menards, menards.com, safehometestkits.com to find all of our kits. And again, we have 20 new kits coming out between now and Christmas, and we'll have more broad spectrum, including solids. We're going to offer kits where people can ship a solids back to us uh, to analyze as well. Well, that's just absolutely wonderful. And it's great that you're providing the service. After hearing you speak, I'm going to be very careful about the water that I drink and uh, hearing about the consequences of bad water. Yeah, we should test our water just for the fun. Of it. We, we do live in New Jersey. <laughs> super fun side of the universe or something. We looked up the super fun side before we moved. There was one black ball on the map. <laughs> right. So anyway, that was Chris Myers, and you're listening to Passage to Profit. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Welcome back, everybody, to Passage to Profit. So far, um, we've heard, uh, we've we've certainly carried our water on this show. <laughs> and no, learned, if you missed what Chris said, boy, you got to listen to that on the podcast. That's on riveting. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. I, we could have talked to him for hours about these stories anyway. Right. And it just, uh, you know, health is so important and you, yeah. you take water for granted, uh, but there could be some nasty stuff in there. He has so, the testing kits. He has the stories to back up why you need them. I mean, uh, I it's, think it's, it's absolutely fantastic. You can't get your health back sometimes. No, you cannot. So, yeah. um, but we have an equally compelling guest coming up next, our very own Pavita Howe, who we've just known forever and ever. And uh, she's been a uh, super important part of the New Jersey uh, ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And right now she is the director of entrepreneurship partnerships at Rutgers University, where she manages external entrepreneurs and their relationship with Rutgers. Welcome to the show, Pavita. Thanks so much, Richard and Elizabeth. It's great to see you and thank you for having me on the show. So tell us a little bit about what you do right now for Rutgers and uh, how you help entrepreneurs. Sure. So I, I'm involved in entrepreneurship partnerships and we've created a new initiative in the Corporate Engagement Center at Rutgers that was uh, created to help bring visibility to Rutgers entrepreneurs, make connections into the university community and help Rutgers entrepreneurs to build and grow their businesses. So as you all know, Rutgers is a really big place you might not know that there are pockets of entrepreneurship happening across the community. There are over 500,000 living alumni for the university, and many of those are entrepreneurial. And there's over $700 million in research budgets, which is more than all the other New Jersey universities combined. So there's a lot of innovation happening from faculty, students, and alumni. And so this initiative was created to try and bring those together. Um, a lot of other universities have entrepreneurship centers and they are promoting a lot of the innovation and entrepreneurship that's happening because Rutgers is very large and also very old. Those, thing, those activities exist all over. And so this was an effort to try and pull some of that together. It can be challenging for external people to navigate so we, we created a place for people to go if they want to connect with entrepreneurial activity at Rutgers and find those opportunities and resources and connections that might be able to help them or to help the grow the Rutgers entrepreneurial community. That's excellent. So how many people do you think are doing entrepreneurship types of things at Rutgers right now? Oh, it's hard to say. We have um, so many different centers uh, and of, of technology, of innovation, and our alumni and students. So people working in many different areas. Uh, Rutgers is well known for biomedical and health sciences. There's a lot of technology and engineering happening. We have people in food science, well known for agricultural science. Uh, cancer research. So there are many different places where there, there are exciting things happening. So if, if there's an entrepreneur out there who's listening to us in uh, Washington State and they have a university close to them, 
and they want to get information about the types of programs that their university is offering, what kinds of things would you recommend that they do? Uh, so some, some universities do have an entrepreneurship center or a program that they can connect to. Um, they, it's usually possible to connect to people in research if that can help your company, um, get involved with recruiting for talent, uh, having students work on projects. Some universities have funds affiliated with the university that they can apply to and accelerator and incubator programs. And, um, and of course, just the network, the alumni network can be very valuable as well as the university network internally. Uh, so I guess I, you know, it's, it's interesting to think that the alumni network could be of uh, a, a strong uh, resource for entrepreneurs. And uh, it's interesting, I don't normally uh, suggest that when entrepreneurs uh, come to me looking for support. And uh, I think I'll do that. I'll, well, first of all, I'll send them to you. Um, but I'll also mention too that, you know, based on where they went to school, they, they may be able to harvest some of those relationships for uh, support, so. Right. It's amazing to me how many very successful people there are in this area who went to one of the universities in New Jersey, and Rutgers especially too. And I know Pavita, uh, before you took this spot, you helped with the saliva test for COVID, you helped distribute that, right? You were on a team. So yes, I did end up helping with that effort um, because we were in a corporate engagement center when COVID first hit, everything shut down. People were, everybody was scrambling, right? To see what they could do to help. And uh, it turned out that uh, we had the, uh, the RUCDR at Rutgers was the lab that developed the COVID-19 saliva test, the first one to get emergency use authorization from the FDA. And at, once that was announced, they were bombarded with inquiries from all kinds of places, uh, states, companies, other institutions that wanted to implement testing on their sites. So as Rutgers was setting up testing for not only for the, the Rutgers community, but also for other communities within New Jersey, they were getting inquiries from all over the place. So they, they came to the Corporate Engagement Center because we do interact with external partners and asked if uh, we could help out with fielding all these inquiries and help people to figure out how to set up testing in their lab. So um, I do have a science background before I went to business school, but I was not expecting that I would be working in the RUCDR lab and uh, documenting the entire process of the, the lab and, and the testing that they run in order to get results that they can then report to the state and to the health departments and so on. So we put together a knowledge transfer package and we interacted with several universities in New Jersey and across the country. We talked to some of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, we talked to uh, you know, chief medical officers and the state health departments. Uh, including one that turned out the the uh, Surgeon General of the state was a uh, Rutgers alum. Um, so, <laughs> it's an so, alumni network again. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it was a great source of pride, obviously, for Rutgers to, to have been able to help that way and to implement testing so quickly. Um, and it was also very rewarding to be able to work with them just to be able to help out at a time when, when everybody was just scrambling and trying to figure out how do we bring people back to school and to work? How do we keep people safe and um, how to just roll out the testing as well? Right, so that strong entrepreneurial, innovative, scientific base that Rutgers had positioned them perfectly to be able to come through in a crisis. And, yes. and to work day and night, because I think your labs are going 24 seven, right? On this, yes. um, to get this done. And so it is a natural place for an entrepreneurship community hub, I think Rutgers is, because they, they are really strongly situated for innovation. Yes. And we have students, faculty, and alumni who are all, you know, different types of entrepreneurship, different types of technologies and ideas. And we, there are resources available for all of them in different ways. We have for, for those types of technologies, which are developed often in Rutgers labs, 
their internal programs uh, like Tech Advance, which I was very involved with before I took this role, and uh, Health Advance, which is to which are both gap funding programs intended to help commercialize Rutgers technologies and get them closer to the point where a company or investor is willing to step in and help them, um, as well as a, a program called i which is actually open to alumni as well as students and faculty. And it focuses a lot on customer discovery and just understanding what strategies are involved in commercializing their technologies. And then of course, our business school, we have um, a an, an food innovation center, an eco complex that focuses on clean tech and environmental technologies and uh, several other programs, of course, across the business school and other places to help support these uh, entrepreneurs. It sounds like a lot of activity. Um, you know, I do follow you on social media and a while back, I remember seeing you in India with some New Jersey luminaries. What was that all about? <laughs> so yes, uh, I guess that was about a year and a half ago. Uh, governor Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, uh, had a, a delegation that went to India for uh, you know, business partnerships. So they were interacting with schools uh, or colleges companies and organizations to help build partnerships and really to attract businesses to come to New Jersey and, and have locations here. So uh, a number of the New Jersey universities participated in that trip as did some other very interesting uh, and well-known people. And so, yeah, it was very exciting. We went, uh, I was selected to go as the Rutgers representative, um, I, you know, mostly because someone else probably couldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was an You're amazing trip. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing trip. It was one week. Uh, we went to uh, eight cities in seven days. I lost track of how many flights we took from city to city. We had long days with back-to-back -back meetings and sometimes we'd be traveling two hours on a bus to get to a half hour meeting and then get back on the bus and go again. Oh, business um, travel. Oh. It was, yeah, it was, <laughs> and it's such a different culture and environment. And even though I have ties there, um, it was still just a completely different experience. So there was a lot of culture, but also uh, you know visits to some of the big universities there. Um, interactions happening with, you know, Princeton, NJIT, Rowan, Rutgers, we were all, we all had representatives there. And we all bonded too, as, because it was an experience that we probably never have otherwise. That's great. And, you know, one of the things that we hear uh, being located in New Jersey sometimes about the ecosystem is fragmented, but I think things like this can help bring the institutions together. So that sounds very positive. Why India? Well, they've actually had trips to other places. I know there's been, been a big initiative with Israel as well, but I think they look at what is similar or what makes sense for the culture in New Jersey. And in India, actually, the governor had a strong message about the economy, the culture, the community, um, the, the proximity to places like New York and Philadelphia and being in the Northeast Corridor. Um, I think by the end of the trip, we could have all repeated his speech because we heard it <laughs> many times. Um, but it was it was true, and it, and and one of the things they talked about was comfort because uh, there there is a large uh, Indian culture in New Jersey as well, and a very dense population, and so you're close to many many companies and and people too that make a community that that is more comfortable for people. I think. Well, that's very well said. So you brought a guest with you, right? And uh, can you introduce him and uh, maybe uh, introduce Dr. Wan and take it from there? Sure. So I'm excited to introduce Dr. Wan, who is the founder of Perfect Life Nutrition. And uh, the, the products that they offer are Peanut, uh, which are healthy plant-based uh, snacks for all. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing a, a, a good enough job of introducing him, but I want him to be able to do that. But what I should say is that he is also a very proud Rutgers alum. He has a great story and very much like what we hear often at Rutgers, people who work hard and have become entrepreneurs and become very successful. And he's had some very exciting things happen 
I did want to know because uh, we were having a conversation at Rutgers the other day and someone said yes and one thing we always remember about Dr. Huan is that he participated in a business plan competition on campus which I think was one of the first big moments for him uh, related to Rutgers and he's had many good things ha happen after that so I'd like to introduce Dr. Huan and welcome. I'm so glad you were able to join us as well on the show and we'd love to hear more about your story. As uh, Pavita mentioned, I'm a proud Rutgers alumni. Uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the show that I have three degrees uh, and I'm working on my fourth degree already from Rutgers University. And uh, I owe Rutgers uh, basically every success that I've had so far. Um, so I'd like to introduce my company. Uh, Pavita mentioned the name of the company is Perfect Life Nutrition. Uh, the product that we make is uh, branded Peanut Crunch. Um, it's a baked peanut puff. And it's the first peanut puff that is actually made from navy beans, brown rice, and peanuts. As opposed to most snacks that are made from snack, from corn, our products are based with navy beans, which are way more nutritious. And what's cool about this combination, which is a proprietary blend that I came up with, is that it actually combines the different proteins from these plants and it makes it a complete plant-based protein, which is very unlikely to find on not just snacks, but in food uh, that is made from plants uh, anywhere. Um, and what it does is that it actually has the effect that it's supposed to have uh, on muscle building, muscle recovery, um, you know, so, so it's actually really good for people who are active. I think Chris, you probably appreciate this since you're a professional baseball player. Um, I did a lot of work uh, with athletes in some of my past companies. Uh, I used to work for Power Bar. So I learned a lot about the nutrition needs of athletes. Um, but one of the problems in developing products for these companies was that um, it was always geared towards the athlete. So, you know, the, the requirements of the nutrition requirements of an athlete are very different from the regular person that is active, you know, maybe a, a mom that plays with the kids or um, any of us that goes to the gym on the weekends and things like that. Uh, yet they're being marketed, you know, to the mainstream. Um, and it always bothered me that, you know, people were having these really high sugary bars, uh, thinking that they're good for them because they see an athlete eat it. Well, it might be good for the athlete because their requirements are so much higher than us for energy. Or they're making money promoting the bar. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that could be possible. <laughs> right. But for us, it's just sugar that is going to turn into fat. So this is why I came up with this, this product. Um, it's really geared towards the mainstream consumer, but it provides a benefit um, that is beyond just being a healthy snack. It's actually a nutritious snack. It provides uh, really good, healthy carbohydrates, fiber, and protein, all from plants. Well, I went on your website, Juan, and they look really good and they only have 130 calories per pack. So it's, it looks like it could be a decent diet food too, if you can use it as a protein. Um, so I definitely am gonna order some of these, but yeah. you were on Shark Tank. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was in Shark Tank in October um, of last year. That's when the, the show aired. Um, we had actually applied to Shark Tank about two years prior. Um, it wasn't until you know last year that we got a call from the producer and uh, asking if uh, we're interested in participating in the Shark Tank. And I was like, of course, you know, hell yeah. <laughs> um, they, they thought that the product was very interesting um, and very unique. Um, apparently we were selected you know, among thousands of other food products that were submitted. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the cool things and stories that uh, you don't see on the on the show itself, if you ever if you see it, um, is that uh, the sharks. You know, once you enter the shark tank, they uh, it's a mess in there. You know, it's not like how they present it on on TV. Uh, everybody's talking, and everybody really wants to figure it out whether the company that they're talking to is is good, is any good investment. Um, and Mark Cuban, you know, is, is one of those guys that just kind of sits back. I don't know if you noticed that in the show, but he sits back and he just observes and he kind of takes a lot of information from what everybody else is asking. But there's something going on in his head. And I feel like he knew what he wanted. Um, 
Uh, actually, his wife had actually tried my product before, and he had tried it and he loved it. So after uh, you know 20 minutes of all the other sharks kind of discussing and asking me questions, he just came out and said, hey, I tried your product before. We love it. I would like to make you an offer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, went, we did a little back and forth, uh, but, you know, I secured $400,000 as an investment from him. And uh, now we're working with his team, you know. That's fantastic. That's awesome. And yeah. the exposure that you get on Shark Tank is is worth more than the $400,000, right? Because those yeah. shows, they play over and over and over again. And so... Well, just <clears throat> the, the first uh, week when the uh, air showed, um, I think we increased our sales by almost a thousand percent. We had more than 10,000 purchases within two days, right. <laughs> uh, all going through a website and Amazon. Sure. Wow. Yeah. Chris, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I was, I was super interesting. I, I like the part about the shark tank. Uh, can I ask Pavita a question in relationship to? Yeah, sure. One, Dr. One. So, Pavita, uh, at Rutgers, working with Juan and other entrepreneurs, do you ever get involved with investors who are interested in getting on the ground floor of a startup business or a new invention or an existing business with new products and inventions that come along? Absolutely. So we, we uh, interact with investors in the New Jersey community. Uh, there are so many great uh, people out here who are interested in every at different stages. So sometimes we have investors who are interested in very early stage product development in the research side. And we have others who are angel investors who might be interested in more of a, you know tech startups or maybe digital health. And then we have investors who are, are looking for companies that are going concerns, generating revenue, and have already got some traction and working their way up. So we, we reach out to a lot of companies ourselves as well. And uh, one was one of the ones that we did find. Um, you know, we, heard, we were hearing news about his successes and we reached out to him. And uh, we also have a secret weapon who I, I like to talk about. Um, my colleague, her name is Kara, and she is our corporate intelligence person. And so she watches for stories about uh, alumni at companies, at startups that are raising funding, uh, filing for IPOs, launching new products and doing exciting things. And we often reach out to them. And so some of those are further along. And uh, when we talk about alumni, obviously we support students and, and faculty as well. But when we talk about alumni, some of them are much further along and being very successful. And some of them are ready to give back as well. And others are still building and growing their business. And for them, we try to make connections to several places. And Dr. Juan is an example. We had, uh, you know, we were able to connect him to our food innovation center. Uh, he was looking to connect to buyers and Dr. Wan, I'm making a plug for you. We're looking for buyers in the retail space that are interested in, in his products. And, and then also connecting him back to students who might be interested in working with this company. Um, but with investors, we have them at all different stages. And so we can connect uh, alumni to investors in the community based on their, their stage of business and their areas of interest. Kenya, well, do you have any questions? Well, I just wanted to say, you know, kudos to Dr. Juan about your product. I, I'm a fitness coach um, and I teach a lot of cycling and do a lot of stuff. And it's hard for me to find products that are friendly to, you know, helping me manage my blood sugar. And so, you know, I would, I'd love to sort of learn more about what you're doing in that regard. And then Pavita, I just had a question about, um, are there any particular industries that you're seeing any exponential growth in, in terms of some of the innovation that's coming along the pipeline at Rutgers? Well, so obviously with COVID hitting, uh, there were many new things being developed and everything from testing to therapies to, you know, the, we were running actually the vaccine trials for Johnson & Johnson, a big chunk of those were run at, at Rutgers. And then of course, technologies that will be developed to try and adapt to our new lifestyle, the new normal, as people say, um, and, and then the, the future of, you know, things like smart cities, 5G, um, non-traditional vehicles, uh, those are all things that are, are hot right now. And of course, food products, um, Dr. Juan is, is one example. We highlighted an entrepreneur on our, our new website, uh, Lou Cooper House, who runs a, 
a new startup called Blue Nalu, and they are developing cell-based seafood uh, in San Diego, and they've got a great story too. So we've, we, there are lots of different examples of the trends as well as what comes about as a result of our current state of the world. That's great. You know, I've got another question for Dr. Wan, and that is, do you test your water before you <laughs> put it in your product? <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you and Chris, though, have some synergies together. So I just heard Chris say he'd help get you on some platforms. So Chris, what, yeah. what is that going to look like for Juan? So Juan, what do you need, too? Uh, actually, uh, Chris is fine because I, I'm a scientist, too. Uh, I have a PhD in food science. And I remember in the lab, I'm a, a mass spectrometrist, actually. That's how. Okay, yeah. That was, that was, I did all my research. You and I have plenty to talk about. On my spectrometry and HPLC. And I remember... Um, you know, one of my uh, my friend's students, um, she was doing analysis on water over at, uh, at uh, New Jersey. And I think uh, her master, her dissertation, she concluded that the water in New Jersey was just an excellent water. And it was better than any other state. <laughs> so I always wanted to find out whether it was. Uh, <laughs> so that's uh, great. You know, I, it, uh, <laughs> it's been a fantastic segment. Unfortunately, we have to take a break. And we'll be right back with more Passage to Profit right after this. So find these products at pnuff.com and do go find them and try them. Right. Okay. Amazon we'll be, as well. We'll be right back after this. Well, welcome back, listeners. You're listening to Passage to Profit, the inventor show on WOR 710, Voice of New York. If you missed our show so far, you really... You've missed a lot, yes. You but should. you can get it back. Just go to our podcast, which will be out tomorrow. And we're also available on Pandora and iTunes and all the major podcast platforms. And, but if you want to see everybody's beautiful faces, but I tell you, we get the best looking people on this show. I really, <laughs> <laughs> is that do. a backhanded self-compliment? No, I'm not counting us. I'm, like, I'm talking about our guests. Well, you are beautiful. I mean, um, so you'll see us on YouTube. And some of the visuals that people gave us um, get cut into our YouTube presentation, too. So go to our YouTube channel, Passage to Profit Show, and you can see the show there. But um, Sounds great. Who's without further guest? ado, yes, I have spoken to this person before, Richard Squires. He has life story. And I was... I was like, you have to come on the radio show. Everybody has to know about this because this is so cool. So without further ado, welcome, Richard. Thanks so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Richard. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, among these other guests, everything that you guys have been talking about has been totally fascinating. So my company is Life Story. I'm the founder of Life Story. I'm a writer and a storyteller. And at Life Story, I write your memoir for you or for your loved one. I'm showing a picture right now of, one of, the, of a recent book that I wrote. And uh, if you want to see the image, check out the YouTube video. But, um, you know, many people have had the idea that they would love to tell their story uh, and create a legacy that their family will have for always, but they find it difficult putting pen to paper. So that's where I come in. And how it all began for me is a story in itself. I had a light bulb moment because I grew up with a very close knit family and my grandfather was always sharing stories. He was in World War II. All my family members shared stories, but there was this one story that my grandfather told that really captured my attention. And that's what gave me the aha moment when I realized that I wanna write people's memoirs. Um, I knew that this was my path and that writing people's memoirs would fulfill their dreams and fulfill mine. So the, the best way to describe life story is to walk you through a day in my life. On a day-to-day -day basis, I typically meet with my clients. During COVID, it's been mostly virtual. Uh, the first interview is where I guide my clients with questions to help prompt them to recall times in their life. It's funny because a lot of my clients say that they've dreamed of writing their memoir and they've even started writing their own memoir, uh, but they learn it's a difficult task. So for people who have started their own writing, I weave that into their books. And interviews can also include family members and friends who have stories to tell. Uh, listening to them tell their, share their stories, it's like reading a good book or, or watching a great movie. I cannot wait to see how it continues to reveal itself. It can be emotional for my client. It gets emotional for me. I get a sense of who they are, how, they, how I can best portray their voice in their memoir and create a journey for their loved ones to read and cherish. Um, uh, two, you know, quick funny anecdote, it, both involving Frank Sinatra, is that I wrote two memoirs of guys who knew Frank Sinatra. One was about a baker, um, Al, who baked Sinatra's favorite cheesecakes. 
And another <laughs> client of mine, uh, his name was Lionel. He was a, a business mogul who knew many different people and he was friendly with Frank Sinatra. Both of these guys come from different walks of life, but their experiences were so interesting. It was an honor to write their memoirs. Um, writing a book is a lengthy process. I transcribe the interviews. I edit all the writing. I incorporate meaningful pictures. I also incorporate other types of services, such as the genealogy report, documents, birth and marriage certificates, ship manifests of when my clients came over from the old country or their families came over. And the research is incorporated into their narrative and it, it adds another dimension. And when they and their families see that it's been incorporated into their narrative, they're speechless. Um, the cherry on top is the cover photograph. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, but our covers really do represent the essence of my client's memoir. And then the finale is the book reveal. On book reveal day, I present my client's memoir and I video it with uh, my client and maybe their family members receiving the book. And if you go on my website, you can see how emotional the book reveal is. It gives me chills every time. And uh, so if you've been dreaming about writing your own memoir, or if you know someone, whether family, friend, business, um, a story that really should be captured, reach out to me. I love what I do. I make my clients feel very comfortable and at ease as they walk me through their journey. Wow. I mean, who, who, what human doesn't want their story told, right? Who doesn't want to be heard? Uh, I think it's just really such a fantastic thing that well, you're doing. And I regret that my family hadn't done this because I did not know until about five years ago that the way that my great, great something grandfather got the money to buy a bunch of farmland in Oregon was that he struck gold in California. I didn't know that until, you know, I was really old and the stories get lost and so easily. And it really is something that you can pass down to your family that they'll cherish forever. I'm, I want Richard to do one, my Richard. <laughs> <laughs> just leave out all the bad stuff but okay? how long does it take how many hours do you sit with the person so every project is unique and custom and it really depends on the person's story how comprehensive they want to be some people want to tell the you know the whole story from for as far back as they can remember or even far back you know further back than that such as everything they that they know about their ancestry um which uh, again can include the genealogy report um, or stories that their grandparents or great grandparents told them about their generations going back, kind of like what you're talking about. Um, but some are, are thematic. I have uh, one book that I did on a couple who spent 15 years in the Foreign Service, and that's all they wanted to talk about was the Foreign Service. Um, very interesting. They, they lived in five different locations. Uh, there's, I was mentioning my client, Al, he was a, a career baker and he wanted to talk about his career as a baker, but we were able to weave some other things in there because wh during his career, he met his wife and, and started a family. So the minimum is usually about four hours, you know, four hours will get you kind of the minimum, really nice, beautiful book, but it goes up from there. Uh, the average I would say is eight hours, you know, se se seven, eight hours of interview, but I've, wow. I've done 12 hours and I have a client I'm doing right now. We did 24 hours. I interviewed him one hour every two weeks. I can just Great. see it right now. Our lives on passage to profit. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you have a very interesting story too, by the way, if you, if you, if I get one, you get one. So, <laughs> so, so Chris, do you have a question <laughs> for Richard? Yeah. So Richard, what's, who's the most interesting uh, book that you put together this far? Um, I mean, you know, I think everyone is interesting. Some family, some stories are more interesting to a wider audience than other people. I would say the most interesting book is, is this one here. I'm, I'm showing a picture for all of you people uh, who are listening on the radio, but this is a, a Holocaust anthology that I did. So it was 11 people who I interviewed, 11 Holocaust survivors. I partnered with a, um, with a, uh, a, a residence, a, a living facility up in, in Bergen County, New Jersey. And that has a lot of Holocaust survivors that came through. And it's just amazing how, I mean, all of their stories are incredible and super important. And every single Holocaust sur uh, survivor story is unique. You know, no, none of them are the same. Everyone's journey of survival is just kind of a lot of luck. I can see that be, being super interesting. Super yeah. interesting. And, uh, but a lot of other interesting ones too. Um, I did a filmmaker who directed Ronald Reagan's uh, sort of um, short political movie. It was like a 15 minute movie called, not Good Morning America. Now, now I can't remember exactly what it's called, but, uh, but 
but he worked with Ronald Reagan and, and the movie became known as the greatest political film made at that time. It was, it was when Ronald Reagan was running uh, for the second time for his reelection. Very, yeah. very interesting. So do you ever get somebody who's maybe shouldn't be telling their story? <laughs> <laughs> thinking of me <laughs> no i'm just actually i'm thinking of somebody who shall not be named no 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 i actually we hope to have him on the show so uh, but anyway <laughs> in, in my opinion no i think everyone's story is interesting i mean you know some people have a story that would not necessarily make a blockbuster book blockbuster film or best-selling book you know it's not uh, something that would interest a wide audience but it's interesting to their family and just just even a simple story the idea of falling in love and getting married or and having kids you know something we can all relate to but that but but each way that it happens to us is unique but then you have other stories where um you know maybe they're fil filled with uh you know wild times right stories they don't want their family to to read you know and sometimes people are like uh you know maybe i shouldn't say that uh you know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think do should we share it and for me as a storyteller and and i you know, have two master's degrees in, in writing with a concentration in fiction. Um, and I used to work in film and I'm all about story and really good stories are full of drama. So the more questionable material in it, the more um, interesting reading it can make. And so my vote is always to, you know, go with it, go there. Go with it. And they say, you know, make a scene. So in terms of like, have you ever helped anybody get their story published? Like I know it goes to the family, but do some people go on and actually publish their work or the work that you do? Okay, so two things. Um, you know, for the most part, the the classic life story that I do, it's it's meant, you know, as a legacy for the family. So it's, it's self-published and it's print on demand and you print as many copies as you want and you can print more later on, give it out to however many people you want. Uh, each book comes with a unique ISBN number and it can be put on Amazon. And I had one client, I helped her put it on Amazon and then it's up to her to market it through her own network, through, you know, social media and, and uh, whatever, and it, it's sold on Amazon. So any of these books can be put there on Amazon. But that being said, I do have a number of clients I'm working with whose books have commercial potential. Um, and I love the idea that some books can be resources um, to, to other folks who, you know, may be starting a journey that the, pe that the author ha who I'm working with has been down that journey and can um, provide, you know, a, a, as a resource, uh, be helpful. But um, so those kinds of books have commercial potential. I'm also talking with a, an ex NFL player. Hopefully I'm gonna, gonna do his book for him. Um, so that, that's always exciting. And for some of these nonfiction books, the, the, what you wanna do traditionally in, in nonfiction publishing is write a, a, um, a proposal. A proposal includes two or three chapters plus other aspects like a table of contents, synopses of each chapter, plus some market research about the competition, uh, book concept, th things like that. So we have time for one more question before uh, we break. Uh, Pavita, do you have any questions or thoughts about Richard's projects? Uh, I was just going to ask if you've ever heard a story that you thought, oh my gosh, they're really going to tell that story? No, because I mean, <laughs> you know the, the most wild things that we've read or, or seen in film, I mean, there's some wild stuff out there and it's great viewing. It's great drama. I'm, I have a client whose father was in the mafia. You know, he's going to change the names, but... Because uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to get killed, right? <laughs> you know, I have a doctor... So one of my clients, Victor, he was a, he was a, he's a doctor and, and during his service, I'll try to tell this very quickly, but it, his military service was after World War II. He was stationed in Leavenworth. He was the doctor in Leavenworth and Machine Gun Kelly was his, his, his patient. They became friendly. But anyway, while he was there, there was a, a patient in the hospital who was stimulating himself with a light bulb and it ended up getting sucked into his abdomen. And he, there's an x-ray in his book. It, it shows the light bulb in there. Thank you, Richard. That was just amazing. <laughs> and, good, and if you could publish, we story. could publish that uh, on our uh, Passage to Profit website. Who maybe we I, could... I have got so many pictures of the cat with Richard that would be just great in his memoir. <laughs> They're so embarrassing. They really are. Oh, speaking of pet <laughs> memoirs, that's a new idea of mine, a, a memoir about your pet. Who's brought you so much happiness. All right, now it really is time for a commercial break. So <laughs> okay. thank so, you very much. You're listening so, to Pat. Thank you. The Inventor we'll, Show we'll, on WOR710. And we'll be back with more stories after this. 
Welcome back, everybody. So we've just been having a great show so far. And coming up next, we have Kenya Gibson with her Power Move segment. So what's on the block today, Kenya? Yeah, so access to insurance is crucial to the success of any business. And Russell Westbrook, who is an NBA legend, he's a point guard for the Washington Wizards, has partnered recently with Accresure, which is an insurance tech company. So they have global insurance that they provide around the world. And his role is focused on providing access of, to insurance for products for minority owned businesses. So, so he saw there was a need and there was a gap in the market. So he decided to partner with Accresure along with uh, Russell Wilson and Sierra. And so they are using their, uh, I guess, their influence and their, their celebrity to partner and provide resources to minority owned businesses to make sure that they have access and opportunities. I think this is fabulous. I mean, it, these are huge blocks to success for so many people. And I don't think people realize how difficult it is for people that aren't in advantage situations to get things the rest of us may take for granted, right? So, and insurance is an important piece of that. So, right. um, you know, people won't invest in you or make substantial investments in your company if you're not insured. So it's a, it's an important piece of the business puzzle. So, so what's great. going on with Fireside? So for those of you who don't know, I started Fireside about a year ago. It is an online video directory of small businesses and I want it to be the Wikipedia of small business by video. It's a YouTube channel and a website and I have been gathering content this past year. So I do interviews of small business owners, uh, Richard Squires. And I did an interview together. That's how much I, how come I knew so much about him and want him on the show so bad. Um, and I'm doing that to gather content. Obviously, that's not going to get me where I need to go if I want to be as big as Wikipedia. So I'm looking for partnerships with other people that have videos to put them on the site. I have to tell you, the videos are, the interviews I'm doing are so much fun. I did one yesterday and the, at the end of it, the guy was like, this is the fun, most fun video I've ever, or interview I've ever done with anybody. And I was like, yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun too, because it's fireside, like fireside chat. So anyway, I'm keeping going. I'm still in phase one, which is content creation, but hopefully phase two, which is marketing, will start pretty soon. So, and that's it for our official presentations tonight on Passage to Profit. But before we leave, we'd like to ask our guests for a few final parting comments. So Chris, what's your take and what's your advice to the audience? So uh, being part of this uh, Passage to Profit was fantastic. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, to all of you who are considering being entrepreneurs and pursuing, as I said before, be prepared to roll the dice, ride the waves high, ride the waves low, stay strong, be smart, and surround yourself with good people. Excellent. Perfect advice. Pavita? Uh, I'd like to say thank you also for having me on the show. I've learned so much. It was great to be here and to have Dr. Juan with us. Um, advice to entrepreneurs, do what you love and you, you'll enjoy working every day. Uh, entrepreneurship is a journey and it can be so much fun. Great. And finally, Kenya. Yeah, I will uh, second those comments. I just love the creativity that was brought forth today on the show and just keep creating and uh, keep dreaming big because there's some great things happening out there in the world. Well said. And so before we leave, let's, so let's run through final time, the websites of everybody that was on the show that and sounds, how you get a hold of them. All right. And of course you can go to YouTube and see this on our YouTube channel, but our guest was Chris Myers, who 40 years ago decided to allow people to test for contaminants in their drinking water and it's built it into this huge business. And as an entrepreneur, he tested the waters. <laughs> and they came back poison. <laughs> so keeps us in business. <laughs> yeah. You can find his home test kits at safehometestkits.com. And he analyzes a wide variety of things. Some things at home, some you have to send to the lab, but uh, definitely worth looking at his website and, mm -hmm to keep your body healthy and stay safe. And you have to listen. If you miss the podcast, listen to it because the stories he tells will curl your hair. Um, and then we had Pavita Howe, who is at Rutgers and she is the director of the entrepreneurship partnerships at Rutgers. You can find her at 
go.ruckers.edu slash ruckerspreneurs or on social media at Rutgers. And she's a great contact if you're a Rutgers alum or if you're thinking about going to Rutgers or if you work in Rutgers and want to outreach, she's the person to talk with. So. And then we had a tasty guest, <laughs> <laughs> Pina, uh, Dr. Juan Salinas with wonderful healthy snacks for everybody and great after workout, uh, get your full pro protein pro profile, pnuff, P-N-U-F-F.com. There's more and more plant pro protein out there. And I'm just wondering what's gonna happen to meat after a while. I don't know, I guess <laughs> we'll find out. I guess we'll find out. And, and we had Richard Squires with Life Story, www.lifestorymemoir.com. You know what, do, your descendants a favor and get your life story published with Richard. Uh, it's really important. I, I, I remember our daughter asking us as a Christmas present, could each of us write up our life story? And I started, I started. that. And after about 15 minutes, I was like, holy cow, where do I go with this? What do I put in? What do I leave out? <laughs> But she was so sweet she wanted that instead of a Christmas present. So I get to yeah, say that. I, I did do part of mine and shared it with her. And then um we oh, you all, didn't tell me that. Yeah. And we went I, online I did, and looked at where I grew up when I was real little. And I, I never read that. Well, I I just all right. discussed well, anyway. I'll so, I won't show you mine either. Okay. Well, maybe we can have Richard help us in that. <laughs> and then we can show each other the finished product. <laughs> so what was in that story anyway? <laughs> And then we had Kenya Gibson, Kenya Gibson with a P at iHeartMedia.com, who talked about Power Move and one of my favorite athletes, Russell Wilson. And um, also that alone Russell was Westbrook. worth him having him on the show for, right? <laughs> but um, but um, iHeartMedia has radio stations everywhere yep, and is do. on the internet and also has digital marketing. So yeah, and we use their digital marketing and it's great. So if you're looking for digital marketing, contact Kenya Gibson at iHeart. They do a great job. Okay. So do you want to say our thank yous? Yes. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Noah Fleischman, our producer, Alicia Morrissey, our program coordinator, uh, Angela Wolf, uh, our video producer. And also don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, not to mention subscribe to our YouTube channel. So this is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt signing off for Passage to Profit on iHeartRadio, WOR 710, the voice of New York.